well, one question is, is this a transitory blip or have we entered in a, a, a new or different era? Well, that's that's also an interesting question because part of, I think, where, what inflation is about is, is there being a multiple equilibrium, multiple paths the economy can take with respect to inflation. If, if everybody gets it into the mind that inflation is, is taking off, they get that expectation, then if I've got a company, I'm going to start raising my prices because I know I got to keep my workers and I got to give them a higher raise. And then some other company says, sees me raising my prices and they raise their prices and then say, well, I've got to keep up with them. And they're trying to keep it. So it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think, you know, where people's expectations of more inflation or inflation accelerating take over. And if you look at the, the uh, hyperinflations we had in the last century, we had 22 hyperinflations. Each of those countries had fiscal problems out the wazoo. They were really, you know, like the Weimar Republic where people were being paid at lunchtime with wheelbarrows full of money. That you know for sure, that's the government printing money. But even if you look at that hyperinflation, the price level rose at a much more rapid clip than the increase in the printing of money, than, than the money was being printed. So let's say the government's printing, you know, just to give a very simple example, doubling the, the amount of money in the economy over the course of the week, but prices are going up not by a factor of two, but by a factor of five. That's because people are expecting prices to go up even faster, and they're making turning money into a hot potato. They don't want to hold the money because if by the end of the week, if they're worried that prices are going to, you know, yeah. go crazy and go and they say, "Gee, I don't want to hold this money. I'm going to run to the store and, and use it." So now. We have more, faster money becoming is is really equivalent to more money in our basic economic theory. That's what's on the Let me share with the readers this uh, famous formula: MV equals PQ. Right. Money times the velocity of money, the monetary stock times the velocity equals the price level times the quantity of goods right. that are being transacted. And you're just pointing out that a given monetary base can be more inflationary if people anticipate. That tomorrow's money will be worth less and rush out to spend the day, which will increase the velocity with which money is being exchanged for goods. It becomes a hot potato. And that's the V in that formula. For, so for, if M goes up by a certain percentage, the V is going up by a much, much bigger percentage. Then for given Y, which is the output, P can go up um, much more due to the V than due to the M increasing. And Now, what's the evidence uh, to your mind that this kind of expectations-driven uh, self-fulfilling prophecy is playing out amongst us now. Well, we don't. I don't. I don't know. I worry about this. I worry that the country, that people start understanding that um, uh, that they start forming expectations. Think about the Weimar Republic. Nobody knew during that hyperinflation exactly how much M was going up. So they had to form judgments about how much is M going up and therefore how much should they, how fast should they run to the store to get rid of their money? How much, how fast should they make V go up? Or think about Argentina that um, had a, uh, you know, has had uh, periods in recent decades where the government would be reporting information about how much money they were printing, which nobody believed. So it was like, there's no anchor in that context. People could say, well, maybe the government's tripling the money supply today, just overnight. Uh, so uh, people are setting prices uh, in, in Argentina based on the exchange rate. The exchange rate was just being driven by expectations. So there's no kind of there, there there's no anchor. That's when things can come unleashed. Am I? Am I naive to think that whereas Weimar Germany or Argentina of more recent times might have had monetary policies which were not transparent, we here in the United States of America can see the books of the Federal Reserve and know exactly what uh, the uh, monetary policy of the government has been and therefore are not as much in the dark about how M is changing as people may have been in those examples you were citing. 
Well, th this is where I wanted to get into uh, this discussion with you because, you know, the MV equals PY formula, that's the quantity theory that a lot of kids lived in, learned in um, introductory economics, a lot of your yeah. viewers. That's a static framework, but we live in a, an economy that's intertemporal, dynamic, going through time. So the Fed could, the government could print more money today and let's say print a lot of money and buy a lot of uh, uh, airplanes for the Air Force, okay? And then uh, five years from now, they could take in a lot of money with by a big tax increase. So just think about the amount of money out there in the economy, not at a point in time, but kind of through time. So we might have a big increase now, but a big decrease in the future. If people think, well, the Fed is going to be adjusting, maybe they'll kind of overdo it this year, but in the future, they're going to underdo it so that through time, we're going to have a reasonable path of the, of the money supply. Then you've got even more uncertainty about this whole process. And, and what the Fed's up to is partly working with the Treasury just to print money to buy lunch for the president. But part of what it's doing, which makes this very complicated to see what's going on from the from the numbers, even if you can, and we can we can trust our government's numbers, is that the Fed is engaging in financial transactions. So let's say I'm the Federal Reserve Chairman, uh, Jerome Powell, and I take a, a billion dollars and I buy some uh, Tesla stock, just suppose it's some security or some bond, Tesla bond. Uh, so I'm printing money, I'm buying this asset. I'm inject, so I'm taking, printing you know, a billion dollars of green piece of paper, putting them out into the economy. We got more money chasing the same amount of goods we kind of think in, in the EEC 101 concept. And I've taken back this asset. I'm the, so now the Fed uh, uh, has added to the money supply. But Hal can say, and everybody else can say or think, well, in three years, I'm going to take that Tesla stock or those Tesla bonds and sell them back into the market and take the money back out. So the Fed's engaged in these uh, portfolio transactions. At the same time, it's just printing money for the president's lunch. And we can't really tell from the Fed's balance sheet because there's, uh, it's very complicated to understand you really can't necessarily break it out. How much of this is a, a pure, you know, uh, paying for the government's bills by printing money because it might be doing some of that now, but less of it in the future. So it's a whole inter intertemporal path of policy. But the one thing that you can be assured of is if you have a projection of a path of, of fiscal policy taxes and and uh, outlays that don't match up, which is our country's situation, then you know that through the through time, this path has got to be one where there's a lot of printing of money to pay for the government's bills. And I think the public may be, may be understanding that. I mean, I've been claiming, I mean, talking about this, not you know, trying to point this out for decades now. I've written books called The Clash of Generations, The Coming Generational Storm. The fact that our long-term finances are leaving enormous bills for our kids and when the, um, you know, when the Fed, when we have inflation, we get hurt. You know, we just talked about the fact that somebody got a checking account or a pension, lost 6% this year. Who's getting helped? If we're getting hurt, the public's getting hurt, it's the government that's getting helped. This is really the, what's called the senior rich tax, the inflation tax. And... Uh, so I think there's going to be a strong, there's a strong tendency of, of countries that are broke through time to try and rely on the senior rich tax until they realize that all they're doing is producing inflation. The economy gets used to high inflation, and that's very destructive to the economy, ultimately, in terms of.